next uh, we have you for the next half an hour to discuss the topic of, of social games and then I'm going to be handing over to, to Jimmy Darcy uh, to, who's going to explore youth leadership in the GA and show some fine examples of that. Just a little bit of context first. Um, the, the, it's probably been an, an area within the association that uh, has required attention. Uh, there has been probably excessive focus on the competitive elements of our games and once you either fell outside the narrow years within which a, a competitive player could participate in the club, often there wasn't that outlet for you then to continue with your love and passion. So over the last couple of years, we've been working collaboratively here with uh, Komogi and LGFA, with uh, Rounders and Handball uh, to try to put together a comprehensive programme of social Gaelic games. Um, you would be very familiar, I'm sure, with Gaelic from Others and Others, which would be the, the, the most vibrant and long standing example of a social game, a social Gaelic game. Um, and many of our healthy clubs will testify and will hear later from St. Colin Kills about the, the energy and value that has brought into their clubs and the female leadership that it, it has opened doors for, um, which is something that um, we need to be mindful of always providing that opportunity and, and the, the balance that that. The, positive balance that will bring into any organisation. Um, but there's um, a lot to be said, Dermot, just generally about uh, the opportunity to continue <coughs> playing. So as, as the old phrase goes, uh, we don't stop playing because we get old, we get old because we stop playing. Yeah, and I mean, I'm just reflecting for the first time, Colin, as you're speaking, like looking at that picture for the Gaelic from others and others, um, one of the things that I feel actually that it, that can impact as much as anything else is the game itself. I mean, I went on this journey because the game, the game as we know it, the competitive game as we know it, I felt that there was a little bit of joylessness in it. Not a little bit, actually, a lot. And I felt that that was reflected in a lot of the fellas around me uh, when I was playing. And I thought, well, I, I wanted to address that, I suppose, when I finished. Uh, and, and just thinking, like, when, when you see that happening in your GA club, I think it gives context. You see the Gaelic mothers, Gaelic for mothers and others, you see that picture there, you see that happening, you see those games being played. I think it gives context and sometimes I think it's the context that's missing and why we maybe get a little bit too intense and a little bit too serious. And then sometimes the joy that connects us when we're very young and why we play the game can maybe peter out a little bit uh, as we get older. So there's the, the ramifications are, are, are significant, um, but I mean, we're focused, I suppose, on people who have finished maybe on that journey, finished playing the game. And I think if you strip it right back, if you go in the door of a GA club, if you are in a place where GA has been played, not even GA, just games, that, that's, you know, you might think you're dropping off your kids, you might be the chairman, you might be a selector on a team, you might have an idea in your, of your social self and the role that you have to play in the GA club, but actually you're going to a place of play. You're going to a place where games are played. You are invited to play in those games too, the same as everybody else. And if the setup isn't there for that invite to work, then the opportunity is there for everybody to create that invite for other people to do it too. I mean, I think that has to be the almost the foundation of, of, of what we're trying to create in, in the GA club. It's not just to be involved and to add your different skills in uh, the, the management and the running of a GA club, those things obviously being necessary and very valuable, but there is an opportunity for us all to play. And I think, Jeannie, if there's anything that we all probably need a little bit more of, it's the opportunity to play for play's sake, you know? Exactly, and the folks are looking at some pictures there of of the, your your wild hurling retreat, um, and, and you know play can happen anywhere. And I think a lot of people's introductions, my own included, I, I didn't grow up in a, in a GA family. My introduction to the first Gaelic game I played without even knowing it was rounders, and mm. I, I just played it in the field and on on hills wherever it could be played. And the rounders association. Um, we, we a lot of the healthy clubs as well have been really driving the, that concept of recreational rounders um, and I, I know Dahi might be online here from the St. Kevin's Club. They have been doing some incredible work um, in, in Dublin here, really creating a movement around rounders and on the previous slide Aoife had up there, we saw some images from a, a gathering we had out in Abbottstown in October or November 2019 when we had a recreational games blitz. Uh, so social games blitz of, of um, football and hurling for for lads uh, kind of in the 40 plus bracket 
and we had uh, 15 hurling teams turn up and five football teams and, and it was a fantastic day um, of fun and play and games and sharing and, 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 and a bit of passion and, and, and a bit of crack. Mm. So even since then, we saw this here little network of clubs that are making these here opportunities available, mushrooming up across the country and um, connecting in with each other on social media and the likes. And then you know, we have one wall handball, which is a great opportunity for people to um, stay fit and active and, and develop a new skill or, or, or love of the game as well. And the Camogie Association likewise are, are, are um, developing a, a social game at the moment that would have been rolled out in 2021, I believe. Uh, so all things pending. But yeah, Dermot, as well, you can see from, from your own motivation, the, the, the benefits to the individual, but also then to the club as well. I mean, this is where I suppose I, I like I came down to West Kerry in a place where there is no hurling and these pictures here are from, I mean, this one here, these, there's 20 fellas there dressed up as women uh, and we played a game in, in Clarny National Park, a game of, 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 a game of hurling, a modified game of hurling to the club, I suppose, to the group. Um, it, 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 there's something about Colin, you know. There's just something about seeing fellas playing the game with huge smiles on their faces for for the whole thing. I'm trying to as well to capture the essence of competition that's in us all, you know, to create a space for that. But the bonds that it creates in just joyfully playing something for the sake of playing it, 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 is 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 very is very real. In a GA club setting, how would this be if in St Martin's in Wexford, in my home club? I mean, this is where I, I suppose I, I'm in admiration of the likes of, of you know, Paul and Kier from Colm Kills and the other GA clubs who do it because I'm I'm on the outside of that and I'm wondering, can I create a game or, or showcase a game or bring people to a game that I love and that I know something very beautiful runs through your body when you play it and, and, and how can I introduce it to people who maybe have never played it or who have never who have never darkened the door of a GA club but might in future you know if they if they get that experience so I think we'll, we, I leave that to the the experts who've done it in the GA clubs uh, to answer I can only say that for the group for the group it, it just the reaction afterwards tells its own tale. Well, our intention, dear, uh, is to to replicate that national blitz at provincial blitz at provincial levels as soon as is humanly possible to get people back together play, play and and um, for to really showcase the clubs that have have um, taken this, these early steps and to invite others to come along and see just how how much fun and and what the the opportunity that it presents. Uh, just for a wee bit of background for clubs out there that, that might be tuned in and might be overly familiar with this, within the Gaelic Games structures and um, the, the social games programme, it doesn't fall within the player injury fund. And that's some people are often concerned that does, you know, is insurance going to be a barrier to this here? P players sign up of their own volition, um, no more than the hundreds and thousands that go out playing five-a-side soccer every evening when, when we can, and I love a game of five-a-side myself. Um, but uh, the, uh, if it's taking place on official GA grounds, uh, 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 then obviously as property owners, then our, our public um, uh, insurance indemnity uh, applies, but it does not fall into the player injury fund. That's just a minor detail, or but an important one for clubs who might be considering starting this up. And uh, Aoife Riley has developed a comprehensive um, information sheet for clubs that are interested in, in exploring how they can start up a social games in their own club. <laughs> But David, you touched on something there about competition and that sometimes there can be a concern here that our ah, social games are trying to take competition out of out of out of our games. That's that couldn't be further from the truth, really. Sure it couldn't. I, I mean, I think that there's what well, for me and what I what I can see anyway is a win at all costs philosophy, uh, like a very intense identity based winning is is detrimental but does bring out a certain side of people who get to the top of a game and and, and that's one thing uh then the inherent competition that's in us does shape how we engage with a game it, is, it shapes our skills like the necessity to catch a ball you know you, if somebody just tosses you a ball that's one thing uh you might catch and you might not and you don't care often when you don't care actually is is, is when your your body responds best but with a little bit of tension and a little bit of pressure and a little bit of competition you know, you get to test yourself and you get to see how how, how you're going. And I, and, I, and I don't think that that's any bad thing. One of the things that I found in, 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 in the game that I, that I play on the retreats is that you can shift the focus from winning. And in shifting the focus from winning doesn't mean competition 
uh, automatically leaves through the back door. For example, I would put the responsibility on in the event of a tackle or, or uh, yeah, a tackle between two people, the responsibility falls to the person most capable, to the best hurler or to the best footballer, whatever it is. So if I'm tackling somebody who has limited experience, I'm going to give them enough space that they can learn, but I'm not giving them the full easy ride where they get to do whatever they want. And so responsibility falls on me in every single moment of every single tackle of everything I'm doing to, 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 to take responsibility for my talents and my capabilities and to afford enough space for people around me to learn. And when you replace winning at all costs with uh, uh, the desire for everybody to get the maximum experience of their visit to a GA club or on a beach or in a field or a forest or wherever it is, that, that really transforms uh, how, you, how you're doing. But competition is, is alive and well in it. And uh, research shows that sport is the one of the one of the best ways for people to naturally um, experience the state of flow, um, and it's you know that's mm. a special state for anybody to experience. So everybody should be given that opportunity. Yeah, but I'm going to bring Paul into the uh, conversation, and feel free to you to jump in you with any questions that you might have with for Paul as well as he talks us through a little bit about um, the what the, the boys call the kind of Gaelic for lads and dads in the in the St. Column Kills Club, and 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 then. I'll bring Linda in about the Gaelic from others and others elements of the club. Paul, um, when when we had that blitz out in Abbottstown, there was actually two teams, the St. Column Kills were so strong, they, they brought two teams along, football teams along to that there blitz. Maybe give the, the attendees a little bit of background about uh, how you got it all set up and where you're at now. So our, our Gaelic for mums and would have started in 2013 and the Gaelic for dads and lads would have followed on in 2014. And really, the, the, the primary focus when we started up the Gaelic for Mums was to, um, funny enough, was to generate coaches because we have in excess of 300 kids on a Sunday morning between five and nine years of age coming through the gate. And we felt that we had a lot of lads stepping forward as coaches uh, because we trained the girls and boys separately. We felt that we wanted more female participants. So we, we, we took on with the Gaelic for Mothers and Others programme. And it's very simple what we said to, we promoted it as, we're going to teach you what we teach your five, six year olds. So the drills are exactly the same. The setup is exactly the same. And we're going to show you what we're showing them. So it was the simple, teaching them how to bounce, teach them how to hand pass, teach them how to do a basic kick. And really what it done was it gave them the confidence that they went from never having kicked the ball before to being able to go out with their kids onto the green and say, right, let's practice. And it works two ways the kids practice and then also the mums are practicing and it's kind of it, it ends up the kids trying to teach the mothers to do it yeah. so from that point of view it gives us it, it gives a great sort of a uh, uh, number of coaches coming onto the team uh, and the same with the lads a lot of the Gaelic for dads a lot of them would have played before but a lot of lads haven't and because it's non-competitive because there's no competition involved and because we kind of keep it on a very sort of low level in terms of what we're doing in the drills it brought lads who have never played before into the squad and therefore we were able to get more coaches more helpers coming on board and you see there in the picture on the top right hand side there, there there's one of our girls teams and we have three female coaches on that which is you know it's really good and most of our female teams and our male teams now also will have female coaches on it so from that point of view that was the first aim within the club we got coaches out of it the other thing then it was, it was retention and the kids interest because the kids were then seeing their parents playing it there was a more of an interest from the kids and therefore you have you have better retention within the club so the parents are more uh, likely to stay involved because there is retention there now because their kids are involved and the kids will love to go up because their moms and dads are playing as well and the games when you run the games in the same style and Jeremy you mentioned that about the ability to play and it's all about exactly the same what we do at academy it's about fun it's about having the smiles absolutely zero competition comes into it you're only ever competing against yourself in this so you're only trying to better your own football skills on it and that's what we teach them the same as what we teach the kids and then what happens is the kids really see that and buy into it and they'll make more of an effort and you'll see in the bottom right there that picture there there's four kids that was at a Gaelic for dads match and that's four children seeing their dads playing football and most of us when we have kids and we've probably retired and we go into coaching kids and we tell kids that we may have played before and you know they don't really believe you but when you're in your late 30s or 40s and you get to pull a jersey on again and have your kids on the side out watching you 
it, it brings so much pride for the kids and also for you being able to go out and talk to the kids and say, yeah, you know, we've done this. The worst is when you come off the pitch and the kids turn around and say, well, dad, you are brutal. <laughs> or fighting them off, you know? yeah. But at the same time, it goes back to sort of, it, it's role reversal. And um, one of the great stories we always tell is the very first time we ran the Gaelic for mothers and others for about nine, ten weeks, we set up a challenge match with Nave Martin, our local club. We I arrived up early, sat at the 15 jerseys into the dressing room. The players walked in and there was just silence and there was no talking and then nobody wanted to play and everybody was not feeling well. And we sat them down and we said, guys, what you're actually experiencing is nerves. And for, for parents to be and I said, what you see is every Saturday morning, your kid is a game and he's not feeling well or she's not free, doesn't want a breakfast or she's grumpy or he's grumpy and he doesn't want to do anything. That's nerves. So they all managed to get a first hand experience of what nerves is. So as a parent, it gave them a great understanding. As then when they moved in to become coaches and trainers, it actually gave them a, an understanding of how kids are feeling before you go out to play a game. And most players, unless you've played at any kind of level, as a parent, you may not have experienced them sort of nerves. So from the club, we ended up with better coaches. We ended up with better attention. It also means as well, in terms of sponsorship, you know, a lot of the parents uh, are all involved in some form of business. It's easier then for to go and chase sponsorship within their own club members because they're all involved in business and because they're now playing. And our Gaelic for dads and lads actually sponsor one of our underage teams. So we got massive benefits out of that from, from a club point of view. That's and that... Real, yeah, a real um, virtuous circle that you're after creating in the club, Paul. Yeah, it and it feeds it feeds from there. The next thing it, it kind of feeds from there into the community, and, and so because really you have this bunch of twenty or thirty or forty lads who may not have known each other and now playing in a group. The same with the girls. You might have thirty, forty, or fifty girls there who step in and step at any time. To try and organise events that, uh, and you see some of the examples there of what we've done this year. So the top left there is a Movember last year, which we've done for the Gary Kelly Centre here in Drada. Majority of them are Gaelic for dads and lads. So it's a lot easier to ask people to get involved in, 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 in activities, whether it be the Movember, whether it be the Pieta House, whether it be the So Sad. So this year, last year alone, as a club, for external community groups, we would have raised in excess of about €25,000. And that's probably possible because we do all know each other. We're getting to know each other. We're a massive club in terms of influx of people into the East Mead area. We're all technically outsiders. So it's a great way of pulling people together to get to know each other. And then you can go into the community and it helps us then to sort of get better penetration within the community itself. Also means within the community, you can go nowhere uh, without bumping into something you're going to know. And that's, that's great. Paul, can I ask, because it seems like um, like it, it's, it, the role in a GA club can sometimes be your limitation, like, you know, if you are the selector or if you are the chairman or whatever. And it seems like those roles have just all been blown open to where everybody is a player or, or is involved at a coach. It doesn't really matter. They're just, they're all part of the club in a way that those roles aren't limitations. Is, is that the, that's the feeling or... Absolutely, because traditionally what will happen from a coach's point of view, they're ex-players, they're ex-people within this club, they're somebody who've played at any kind of high level before. And that's all That's all fine and well when you're at your minor age groups, you're under 21, you're seniors and that. But really, as we all know from academy, five, six years of age up to maybe 13, 14, it's all about just skills. And the skills aren't that difficult to teach. And the more parents you can teach the basic skills to the better the skills are going to be within the, each, of, each of the kids as well. We don't need really, really highly qualified, you know, level sort of three coaches or four coaches with at, at, at five and six years of age. We want people that can go out. We want lots of people that can go out there and teach them how to bounce a ball, teach them how to hand pass properly, teach them how to kick properly, the really simple stuff. And the more parents you can get involved in doing that, the better the level of participation, the better attention is going to be. And, you know, and it just it introduces fun because it becomes a lot more fun because you have more people able to do it. You're able to spend more one on one time with players. So from that point of view, that from a player's point of view, it's brilliant from that. You know, it, it adds great depth in, in, into our coaches. Dermot, I'm going to bring Linda in there because to speak to that very point, because she is uh, the, the kind of the manifestation of exactly what you're talking about there. Linda, if you could unmute your your, your um, mic there, just uh, because I know obviously you're, you're 
the daughter of um, a St. Colum Kills legend, uh, Jock, sir, who uh, you know, has, has carried the, the, as chairman for years and years, carried the club on his shoulders, probably like many um, stalwarts around the country. Uh, but t- tell us a little bit then about your your journey. Like you, I know at a young age you would have been on the executive as treasurer, and maybe to Jeremy's point, that, you know, you, that, that was a role that was that you didn't see how you got beyond. But the getting from others and others opened up some other avenues. Yeah, well, I suppose um, it, it, it's Kira. Sorry, but uh, oh, sorry, uh, Kira. Uh, Grant, but uh, at the, I was to try to were back in the early two thousands of the club, and we were struggling to pull together a committee at the time. The, the club was small, and I suppose I stepped away from it back in two thousand and six for education and work and all this kind of stuff. And Daddy was still chairman, and um, the club went under a massive. Like our community, East Meads, has gone through a huge population explosion, and the club, I suppose evolved and adapted rapidly in in the years that followed and I suppose by the time I kind of wanted to go back when my own children were starting to get involved uh, I didn't really know anyone um, anymore and though dad was still the chairman it, it didn't um, the club had just changed and there were so many different faces that you wouldn't have known people so I suppose my first re-entry into it was I'm going to go down and do this Gaelic from others and Paul welcomed me, but Paul was really the only person I knew when I went down to play because all the all the girls who were on the team were new members, new new to the area, and it was just such a welcoming social environment to go back in and get involved in a team where there was no pressure. There was it was about fun. It was your time to go in once a week and you had the laugh. Paul used to slag us about our abilities. He won't tell you that uh one of the roles of the coach was to tell us all how bad we were at the game but that brought crack to it as well and I mean you touched on the competition piece earlier there was no competition like it was you know the girls we all knew each other's by the end of the season we'd all know each other's strengths and weaknesses and you'd let someone if they were in the mood for running on a particular night you'd let them run and you might go after them one night and you just mightn't go after them the following night but you always had a reason to go down because we just made great friends and I suppose outside of the um the football in part then we became each other's so- social circle uh, very much and then I suppose my own personal experience having been away from the club for nine or ten years it, it brought me back in um, and I suppose I'm back on the committee now I'm the PRO for the club I, I help organise an awful lot of the events and an awful lot of the women on our Gaelic for Mothers team are usually the people who step up and volunteer when stuff needs to get done around the club and we all know that stuff you know work needs to be done so and 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 these are the groups the gaelic for mothers and the, the gaelic for dads are the groups that volunteer to get stuff done so i suppose without having that as an outlet it's hard to see how you kind of would have come back in and integrated back into something that had changed so drastically over time you know so uh, yeah. Kieran, I, I, I apologize. I, I set up my Linden notes up here from the. Oh, uh, <laughs> and um, so, you know, and again, like you were, you were talking about, uh, uh, similar to Paul's experience of the young ones getting the opportunity to see the the mums out playing. That's right. Yeah. Um, I actually went back. I, I, I thought that I had a bit of skill. I wanted to always play football when I was younger, and it was never a girls' team at the time. And uh, I did a couple of years at the Gaelic for mums, and then we actually set up a second team. Uh, two years ago within the club and I went back and played on the second team as well and played proper junior football now I wouldn't have been much good but I got the chance to actually don the club jersey and play for a club team as well uh, which was something I never had the opportunity to do when I was younger so and we've had a couple of girls who've had the ability to do that um, through the Gaelic for Mams and gone back and played a bit more competitive football and then just gone back to the Gaelic for Mams as well because I, I did it I tried it. It wasn't for me. I preferred the, the non-competitive part of it, but it gave a taste for something that I thought I'd always wanted to do. So, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, uh, dear, you know, tuning in there and listening, what, what's your reflections on, on the stories from St. Colin Kills? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is this is it, Colin. I mean, we talked about this during the week and, and this is what I feel like I, I miss an awful lot down here. Um, it's beautiful. It's it's just it's so comprehensive. Just listening to the lads, the human experience, like the individualized human experience of everybody who gets the opportunity to feel nerves like Jeannie Mac, what a what a basic thing, but what a beautiful thing to get to feel. So you understand the experience of the people around you and particularly the people who you're shaping and are, are helping to shape uh, underneath you as, as they come up along. Um, mm-hmm. I was wondering, Kira, what's that like? Is there an observable change in people who come on their first night 
to then looking at them maybe three or four nights later what's that like yeah the, the really uh people and a lot of people would say oh my own sister actually uh and take her experience i joined it maybe in 2015 and she didn't join until the following year and she was very nervous about coming down didn't want to come down and kind of was like oh i won't know any of the girls and you know them and uh, you know and, and lisa had been secretary at the club for seven years uh probably maybe four or five years prior to that, you know, but it like that she didn't really know anyone on the team. And I suppose she came in and after two, three weeks, she was part of the fabric of the team as well. And it's just a, a very welcoming um, environment. And everyone's just there for a bit of headspace for themselves and to support each other. And, you know, it, the sense of, I suppose, belonging, um, it, it's tangible really, you know. Well, that's, it's appropriate because when the GA was looking for to launch the new manifesto where we all belong, it was the St. Colin Kills Club that they that they chose and, and, and rightly so, because this is like the Colin, Colin Kills Club has been involved since phase one of the Healthy Club project and actually their work preceded that and, and, and goes far beyond what the parameters of, even the chief medical officer could possibly have imagined a healthy club could deliver on behalf of its community. And Paul, just I know you're you're the chair of the, the, the ladies section of the club. Does does the club operate under the one club model? Yeah, very much so. So we, we adopted a one club model and a constitution about three years ago. So there is no uh, sort of difference in the club within ladies section and the men's section and, and juvenile. It is just one club. So we have, we probably have very close between, I'd say it's 48% female, 52% men, that sort of ratio of numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's very much as really, the social element has pulled it in. There's 146 sort of uh, female adult players within the club. That's our senior girls and also our Gaelic from mothers and others who get involved as well. Mm -hmm. In the eight years that I I was involved, I done seven years as, as the manager, coach, instructor, uh, whatever you want to call it, but there's probably over 120 girls had a, has come and had a go and you dip in and dip out and it, it's very much that. So it, it, it pulls it together as, as a single club. The whole thing is based around, as I say, it, it's non-competitive. So uh, if I'm doing drills, I'll say, guys, come up. If you want to run, that's fine. If you don't want to run, I don't mind. It, you know, you can do, you're only ever competing against yourself here. I don't care if you don't want to do the drills. You can do the drills. You don't have to do the match at the end, whatever. You can come one week. You don't have to come for three weeks. It's So it's very much, it's it, it changes from what coaches traditionally do where we're setting up drills and pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, I, um, I and really you, you tell, I my opening night, any new player coming is that, yeah, some of these girls are here six years and they're still no better. Uh, you know, so uh, it's, it's very much you take that approach that it's fun. And I see Kira will laugh there in the background. And that's kind of, if you adopt that sort of, we're only here for, we are only here for the crack, nothing else. Uh, in all the games you've played over the years, and we've played a lot through the blitzes and all that, I couldn't tell you one of the scores because I don't keep scores, I don't care. To win in a game is for one player, it could be, as Jeremy, you mentioned, it could be that you catch the ball. That could be a win for one player. Some of them even to kick a ball during a game. Uh, or hand passes during the game. That is a win for them. The score, that's, that's you know, that's sometimes a girl will score who may be there for two years have never kicked the ball and she scores. To her, that's like walking up and lifting up the, 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 the Sam McGuire. That is her massive achievement, just to be able to kick it and it went over the bar. And for our kids to see that, and I've seen girls jumping around the pitch with delight, and that's what it is, it's fun. And it's the same with the Gaelic for dads and lads. I played that for years myself. You know, you're marking a guy, we're both in our 40s. We've all played competitive football. We know where the ball's going, but we just can't get there because the legs won't get it. <laughs> we still have the same thing. And, yep. and then it's been it's, it's understanding that it's it's fun and then just not taking it too serious and not putting anybody at risk. We all have to go to work the next day. So if the 50-50 tackle, both players pull out and you just go out of the game. So oh, remove, no. remove the competitive element. A quick That's a quick question coming in actually from, uh, before we wrap it up. Christy Keenan there. Um, on the chat, um, wondering, um, do you have a, 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 a age limit for the Gaelic for lads and dads, and do they have to be retired from the competitive game in your club? No, uh, yeah, preferably, if you play played at a very high level, which a lot of the Gaelic for dads and lads have, it can be, and it's the same for the Gaelic for mums as well, you got to be a bit careful with that. We have, on the Gaelic for dads and lads, 35 lads, maybe 40 lads. We actually set up a third team, and I was probably one of them who sort of dropped out from the Gaelic for dads and lads, and I went back playing competitive football in junior D at 44 years of age. 
because I was I'm that competitive type. Um, so it, you have to. It, that's where the balance is, and that's where the trick is. Uh, if you still want to be competitive, if you still want to go in hard for football, if you still want to play that, there is always you know set up a, set up another junior team. You know you can get you only need twenty lads. You can enter your enter your championship in the summer, and that's it. It's the same for the Gaelic for mums. If there's ones who are really really competitive, really good, we'll push them back to play. Go play on our second team because you're well fit to do it, and you have that competitive edge. So it's to get that balance. Uh, it's very much around the people who haven't played or who have played when they were kids, or very much who have played at a, a, a sort of maybe a, a lower level. If you played at a really high level, you just have to manage them guys there, because a lot of them are still fit to play at that competitive level. Mm. Going to be junior. And Kira, any final word from yourself? No, just I suppose it's a ring of endorsement for involvement, and if you can get your uh, members involved and it, it's very much about your members and I suppose not just the playing population but this is something that your members and your uh, community will use and go geez I might have a go at that I might I always wonder but you know it, it's really something to involve people in and that they'll get something out of themselves so it brings people in your gate for a different reason and I suppose you said it at the start when you were talking about the rounders and you're talking about the social games and all that and it really does just talk to that bringing people in the gate for a reason that's for themselves and they're not just dropping children off, do you know? So, um, and they get something back out of the club. So I, I would just fully endorse it. And I suppose if anyone wants to reach out to us and, and have a chat with us about how we do it and what we do, we're, we're more than willing to take uh, uh, questions and calls and whatnot, so. Thanks a million, Kira. And we will be sharing uh, the, the um, document around social games that gives clubs a little bit of steer and advice and guidance and framework about if you want to if you want to start this up um, and I'm going to leave the last word just back over to Mr Ling Dermot. Yeah look at Colin thanks very much uh, thanks very much for, for having me and for and for, for having this as well I, I suppose one thing that is just running with me at the moment listening to the lads is we're very big, uh, probably taken from the soccer model of UEFA coaching licenses and you have to get your level ones, two and threes, all very important things. But maybe in future, one of the levels that we'll have to go is to return to play with that little bit of vulnerability where you have to go back into a dressing room and you have to experience nerves again and you have to play for the sake of playing. And maybe that's a qualification that a coach would take back to an underage team and, and deepen his ability to deal with with what's in front of him and 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 we, where we can play the game in a more beautiful way, you know, um, it's just it's a joy to hear it. It's a joy to know that it's happening. Uh, and these are things that I think 20 years ago, plenty of people wished would be happening or wished were happening, uh, and now they are. And these are the people essential to it. Uh, and I'm just yeah, it's 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 beautiful. Christoph, do it well. It's nice to have you along in the revolution. So uh, we'll be in touch, comrade. And um, thanks a million for your contributions, Kira. Lovely, and Dermot, thanks so much. 